So what I noticed was um, when I normally think about an evangelistic talk, normally you need to get to the death and resurrection mm. of Jesus, which you didn't discuss. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't really have a question. I just, I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. Yes, yes. Okay, so, wow, okay, okay, I'm trying to work out the five-minute version, the 50 minutes of the five-hour version. All right, so, it, it comes down to what is evangelism and what is the gospel. So that's the overlying meta question. What is evangelism? What is the gospel? So evangelism, uh, we would say, is proclaiming the gospel. So that only moves the goalpost back one more, because what is the gospel? And I think, and there's, you know, debate how much is the response part of it. So I think at least there's an implicit response. So when there's a sign that says wet paint, there's an implicit response. Do not sit on this bench. Even though it doesn't say do not sit, there's an implicit command, do not sit. And I think a lot of gospel preaching is like that. There's an implicit command. So we say Jesus is Lord. There's an implicit command. You need to be loyal to him. You need to submit. You need to follow him. You don't have to say it explicitly, but it's there just in the statement, in the indicative is the implied imperative. So I think that's, got, that's evangelism somehow communicating the gospel in all its various forms and, and, and sometimes implicitly, sometimes explicitly, knowing there's an implied response. Then the question is, and what is the gospel? And I've just recently read a really helpful book by Jackson Wu, One Gospel for All Nations. And he puts in his book what most missionaries have been saying uh, in, in their books. And another very helpful guy is Paul Hebert, who used to teach missiology at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago. There used to be three research professors at Trinity. There was Don Carson, Paul Hebert, and Van Hooser. And so he, he's got a lot of good stuff on this as well. So what is the gospel? So in the Bible, there's a variety of metaphors being used. And for our gospel summary, we, we're forced as a summary to pick one of those and we have to leave out the other metaphors. So it's always sort of an unfair shot to say you didn't mention this because it's a summary. I could only mention one metaphor and consistently go with it. And so if we think of God as Father, so sin would be to be disloyal to the Father and, and the correct response is to come back and be adopted. We think of God as King, then it's submit, and, and, and uh, well, you've sinned because you, you've broken a law, and the correct response is submit and, and come back. Um, if we think of God as holy, then what we've done is we've fallen short of his holiness, and what we need to do is be reconciled or restored or, or brought to holiness. And so these guys often summarise it as saying, every, the three main metaphors then for sin in the Bible are either transgression, so you've broken a law, you're guilty, and now you need to be justified or forgiven. Middle one, another one is, um, let's see, you're, you're dirty, you're, you're filthy, you're unholy, you're unsanctified, you're blemished, so now you need to be cleansed, purified. made holy. The third one is you have shamed God, you have dishonoured God, and so now there needs to be some sort of restoration and God needs to show you his face again. So that's why you get that priestly blessing in Numbers, may the Lord bless you, keep you, may his face shine upon you. So that sort of restoration and so we're, we're very used to the gospel presentation using this one. You have broken a law. Uh, now, now you need justification, forgiveness, and Jesus died on the cross to make this happen. Uh, but there are other metaphors we use. And what I'm experimenting more and more with is it seems like the apostles in Acts, when they preached to the church believers, the Jewish people in their synagogues, they went with this model a lot. You've got the scriptures, you know the commands, God sent you the Messiah, you killed him, you, you transgressed. You now need justification and forgiveness. Whereas to the pagans, from Acts 14 onwards, they seem to begin with general revelation, common grace. God has given you good things. He's given you rains, he's given you crops. 
but you're failing to honour him. You're not worshipping him. So what you've done here is you've shamed, you've dishonoured, you've failed to show him the honour that is due him. So now somehow you need restoration and you need faith. All right. And then, and then the, the means for this happening is the atonement of Jesus. So... It's one of those mechanisms, again, where the, the cross is sort of shorthand for the atonement, but the atonement is a theological concept. So what happens is, I'm giving you now the, the 50-minute version, I'm sorry, is, is often we can also say, say you never mentioned sin, because you could also say you didn't mention the cross, you didn't mention sin. And this is where, as a theologian, I would say the theological concept is bigger than the actual words we use. So just like the Bible never uses Trinity, but the idea is there, Jesus often when he evangelizes, doesn't use the word sin, but the idea is there. So, for example, when he gives a parable of the rich fool, the word, he, the word sin is not used, but instead he uses this metaphor, this is how it will be to those who store up riches for themselves but are not rich towards God. That's Jesus' way of saying um, sin. And so there are different ways we use sin in picture language that say the same thing without actually using the word sin. So what I've basically tried to do in that talk is saying, hey, you've been given a good gift from a good God to enjoy, in this case work, a roof over your head, implied, a parent, a country, but you have failed to honour this God. Okay, so that's your sin. So even though I ever use this word sin. And then I mentioned Jesus, if we follow him, somehow he will be our boss. So imply this somehow by following Jesus, this atonement thing will happen without having to necessarily spell out each and every detail. Because again, I sort of think it's this two-year journey because it's this paradigm worldview change which is happening, which won't happen in a 20-minute moment, which requires piece by piece, bit by bit. And I'll just end with this. What happens in evangelism is we tend to evangelise the way we got evangelised and also every tradition ends up with its shibboleth, um, red flag words, which must be used, otherwise you didn't evangelise. So I remember John Chapman used to teach us evangelism. He said he once preached in a tradition where people used to pull him up afterwards and say, you didn't mention the blood. You didn't mention the blood. It's not the gospel because you didn't mention the blood. So for them they had to hear the blood. I remember I once went to a church and this lady pulled me up afterwards and said, you didn't mention the word repent. She had to hear the word repent. And I'm thinking, I, I didn't use the word repent, but I remember using this image of me driving a car the wrong way on a one-way street, having a truck come towards me, and then I do a U-turn to save my life and go the other way, and we in the same way are heading towards doom, destruction, and unless we turn around and follow Jesus, we, you know, we will die. And I thought, well, that's repent, but without using the word. And it's almost sort of the same. Some of us are saying, okay, do I have to mention the word the cross? And I think it's the same thing. What we're trying to get across is the issue of the atonement. God sent us Jesus, and this is what makes Christianity unique. Uh, it goes beyond general salvation blessings, I, I mean John, general revelation blessings, to special salvation blessings, and for that I need to follow Jesus because somehow he is the mechanism who makes this happen. There's an atonement that happens with Jesus.